ahead, spelling mistake. You see it, uh, the entire uh, yep. picture? Good evening and welcome to the Eastman Institute for Oral Health Virtual Engagement Series. My name is Brian Winters and I am the Director of Advancement and Alumni Relations for the Eastman Institute for Oral Health. I've worked at the University of Rochester Medical Center Alumni and Advancement Office for 10 years and at Eastman since 2015. It is my pleasure to be facilitating this event and introducing our speaker. Tonight's town hall style event is the second in our virtual engagement series. It is being recorded and will be posted on the EIOH YouTube page soon. Last month's event titled The Business of Teledentistry is now posted and can be viewed on the EIOH YouTube page. The goals of this evening are to share updates and to keep us all connected in a casual platform that is both helpful and informative. Dr. Elliott will share some general updates since the start of COVID-19 and the effect that it's had on all components of our mission, how we adapted and what's to come. The presentation is approximately 30 minutes and will be followed by 20 to 30 minutes of questions and answers. Please feel welcome to submit your questions through the presentation to the presentation using the Q&A box on this Zoom. I also invite you to email me directly with additional questions after the session. My contact information will be provided at the end of the presentation. With that, please allow me to give some brief remarks on Dr. Elliott's background. Dr. Eli Eliev joined the University of Rochester Medical Center in 2013 as a professor and the director of the Eastman Institute for Oral Health. He is the Vice Dean for Oral Health at the School of Medicine and Dentistry and Vice President for Oral Health at URMC. Previously, Dr. Eliev was the Chair of the Department of Diagnostic Sciences, the Director of the Center for TMJ Disorders and Oral Facial Pain, and the Carmel Endowed Chair at the Rutgers School of Dental Medicine. Dr. Eliev earned his dental degree, master's, and PhD from the Hebrew University and Hadessa in Jerusalem. He specialized in oral medicine at Hebrew University from 1991 to 1995. From 1995 to 1997, he trained in the Clinical and Basic Science Research Program at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Since 2008, he has been the Editor-in-Chief of Quintessence International. Dr. Eliev has published numerous research and clinical manuscripts in scientific and clinical journals. His research focuses on oral facial pain, quantitative sensory testing, neuropathic pain, pain modulation, transition from acute to chronic pain, and the role of inflammation in neuropath neuropathic pain. Before I welcome Dr. Eliev, I'd like to add that over the years, I've had the opportunity to work with many senior leaders, department chairs, and division chiefs. I can assure you that Dr. Eliev is one of the best. The faculty admire him and the residents respect him. Senior leadership at the Medical Center thinks very highly of Dr. Eliev, and they value his opinion and leadership. Dr. Eliev has taught me the importance of thinking seven or eight steps ahead and to always be mission focused. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Eliev. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the introduction and thank you uh, for all of you for joining us. Um, I'll try to share with you what we've been through here in the last few months and maybe beyond and uh, what our thoughts and plans are for the, uh, for the future. Uh, we'll start with uh, saying that why my presentation, okay, good. Uh, this is uh, in, in Monroe County, in this area, county in this area, we didn't have huge number of uh, COVID-19 cases. And uh, the slide 
here showing the Monroe County count, uh, the graph showing the number of uh, uh, admitted patients to the hospital, uh, and the number of deaths you can see in the top uh, and uh, currently hospitalized, and those numbers are uh, two to three days ago. So we were lucky not to have a big surge here, but, uh, uh, and, and we can never know if we will have or not, uh, but I think that the, measure, the measures that we took in the county and in our medical center really helped not uh, uh, getting a, a terrible surge of the, of the virus. Uh, the timeline of things that happened here in uh, March 16, the governor closed schools. And then at that time, we closed our smile mobile units and that are serving the schools. And on the 20th, uh, uh, all uh, non-essential elective surgeries were stopped. So only emergency, emergency services provided, uh, we provided only emergency services. The difference here that compared to other schools is that our residents and the faculty together provided the services and uh, uh, we continued the training of our residents by the fact that they were uh, providing care to patients of need. On the 25th, we had to, we consolidated all our services to uh, the main building, Eastman Dental Center. Uh, we started uh, having issues with having enough uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we stopped most of the research activities, only those that were uh, ongoing research. And we expanded our teledentistry uh, services to uh, uh, urgent care, oral and maxillofacial surgery, oral medicine, pediatric dentistry, and more. On the 30th, we started uh, remote working. Anybody that could work from home, work from home. We divided uh, the, uh, the, so the departments into clinical teams in case that there'll be an exposure in one team that another team could uh, replace it. Uh, we did rotations between the, uh, in the resident and staff. Not all of them were in the same time in the building. And we moved all our lectures and seminars to e-learning. In May, the med university and the medical center started in staff furlough. In uh, May 18, uh, we had resumed, uh, we had resumed the operation room services. Uh, and in J May and June 1st, uh, we, uh, we had resumed our uh, non-elective procedures and we started uh, returning to uh, work uh, in a phase, a phase uh, in the, returning to work by bringing back people from furloughs and uh, uh, scheduling patients and trying to come back to normal activity uh, slowly but surely. During that uh, COVID-19 outbreak, we had several goals. One was to provide emergency treatment uh, to patients that need it and keep those patients out of the uh, very busy emergency rooms. While doing that, we had to uh, maintain our patient safety, the faculty, resident, staff, staff safety, and we also had to support uh, our patient, faculty, and residents that besides the, uh, the, the workload, uh, the situation is a stressful situation facing the unknown, but still will have to provide care to our patients. The challenges were in dentistry, we induce uh, a lot of aerosol, most of the procedures that we do. The proximity of the provider and the patient are very close. And the, uh, the immediate uh, th thing that people think about is that uh, contamination in, and, uh, is, is uh, is significant and people are at risk when they provide uh, care, the patient and the provider. We had an issue with pro doing with having social distancing because uh, our, our building is relatively small and we had to maintain uh, the distance of at least six feet between the people. Uh, PPEs or personal protective equipment was difficult to, to get, uh, but as you can see in the pictures here, all our providers are wearing uh, three levels. They're having uh, N95 on the top of it, uh, uh, surgical mask and face shields, in addition to gowns and hair covers and so on. We started patient and staff screening. Uh, um, and the question is, how do we do that? We had uh, uh, the residents, faculty and staff that were uh, under stress, and we had to address this issue. We had to gain the patient's trust People were concerned to come to the dentist for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, here you can see a picture of me showing gifts that we got from our friends from China that sent us uh, PPEs 
uh, N95 and other masks and other equipment that uh, was necessary at the beginning of the, of the COVID outbreak, outbreak. One of the problems was that uh, it was very difficult to make decisions because there was no data to support the decisions. Do we know that uh, wearing uh, two masks and face shield is enough? Do we know that gowns are necessary? Do we know that uh, uh, the reason is a risk of uh, uh, contamination uh, because of the uh, uh, with that virus? We had no clue. And if we look at the sources of information that we had, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, resources uh, that uh, we didn't know what to count on. But we really followed the uh, CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines, uh, OSHA guidelines, the FDA guidelines, and the state guidelines. Interestingly, we have students and faculty that from more than 40 different countries, and everyone had an idea how it's done in their country, and came with ideas and provided us with some uh, uh, ideas what we should do in order to, to do the work, to, to do the work right. Uh, during that COVID-19 outbreak, we saw about 100 to 120 patients per day from 48 New York State counties. Thinking about the fact that there are 62 counties in New York State, uh, we got patients from more than 75% of the counties, but most of them really came from our uh, area. And the patient uh, uh, distribution, age distribution was mainly between 18 to uh, 54. However, we had more than 50 patients that were older than 80 uh, uh, that came and arrived to our clinic to get, uh, to get urgent care treatment. To maintain or to keep the patient safety, we maintain social distancing, we did the screening. Here you can see the welcoming committee uh, for, page, for patient uh, coming to our building measuring the temperature, uh, providing uh, and answering all the questions that they, are, uh, that they have. We triage the patients, we change our workflow, and we try to be as efficient uh, as we can. The patient screening including, uh, included in addition to measuring temperature, uh, uh, the, set, the following questions related to uh, if they have any symptoms, were they in, in contact with patients that were suspected to have COVID-19, and screening for the, for the faculty uh, and staff were made by uh, a software developed by, uh, by the medical center. It called Dr. Chatbox that each one of us had to do, even now, every morning before we come to work and to answer questions if we have symptoms uh, uh, that are listed below here, are listed here, or temperature and so on. We provided the daily newsletters to our faculty and staff that included the number of patients that we saw and any new updates coming from the medical center. Uh, Dr. Levy was, uh, uh, did that every day. And the time we reduced the number of those uh, uh, daily newsletter, newsletters and, and we don't do them anymore, but it was very important uh, information for our faculty, staff and residents during the outbreak. We had to be creative uh, sometimes. Uh, um, the patient with cleft lip and palate are treated by our pediatric dentistry department uh, uh, under the leadership of uh, Aaron Show. Uh, with meso-alveolar molding device. And uh, this cannot wait. The patient need to have the, the device uh, adjusted based on the, uh, uh, the progress of the condition. Uh, so uh, Aaron Show, uh, Dr. Aaron Show saw the patient and, and, and uh, cr provided curbside treatment to the patient. The, the, the patient and, and his parents drove all the way from Syracuse to be seen by us here. Uh, we had research uh, that we had to continue getting samples from our patients, so we did they use the same methods. The patients arrived to uh, our, uh, in front of our building, and the researchers went out and took the samples uh, from the patients uh, without them getting into the building. Uh, we had a few interesting, we had a interesting things that happened. Our, our foundation board. Uh, provided us with uh, snacks for all the providers, for all the uh, staff, uh, faculty, and residents. And here you can see Dr. Bill Kellen, the president of our foundation board, uh, uh, providing and, and giving away, the, giving the, uh, the snacks to, the, to, to everybody. We also had uh, uh, wonderful support from our staff, and you can see here in the pictures uh, uh, here, that uh, supported the work. I don't think that uh, anybody was planning or trained to do this kind of work, but we had uh, uh, further cleaning and disinfection, screening, 
uh, and I think very stressful work that people went through and, 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 and been able to do one as a job. During the uh, outbreak, we uh, led uh, an international forum uh, and we had a webinar that uh, the uh, speakers were from China, from Wuhan, where the, uh, uh, the, the outbreak started, the first place where the, the virus were, was uh, diagnosed, was found, and, and from people from England, from Sweden, and Jerusalem. Uh, the, um, the webinar was organized by Dr. Yang Feng Ren and uh, Dr. Sarah Marowitz. Uh, and we had 1,800 uh, people from all over the world that attended the, uh, the, uh, the webinar. Uh, we had two, more than 200 questions, and I think that it was very valuable because a different approach was taken in China, in England, in Sweden, in Israel, and here, and we could learn from each other how to address the pandemic and how to provide dental care or health care during the pandemic. We've also been able to publish three uh, manuscripts uh, uh, related to COVID-19 during the pandemic in, uh, in prestigious journals, in Texas International, the Journal of Dental Research, Clinical and Translational Research, and the Journal of Dentistry. The last one in Journal of Dentistry is uh, assessing the, uh, uh, the risk for uh, dental health care professionals during global, global COVID-19 global pandemic uh, to uh, get the disease and uh, or even die from COVID-19. Uh, and both papers here were led by Dr. Yang Feng. Our convocation or graduation this year uh, was virtual convocation. We could not have it in person. And you can see here the website. And those of you that did not uh, uh, visit this website, please do. Uh, you can see presentations by us. You can see uh, the uh, award winners. You can see videos from here. You can, this is an example of a video from the Department of Periodontics, uh, a virtual graduation. There is a guest book that you can sign in. Uh, it will be there forever, so it doesn't have to, uh, it, it, it was not limited to the time of the event, and you can follow and, and, and join and, and enjoy videos and uh, the success of our residents. But we need to reopen, and as, as I mentioned earlier, on June 1st, we reopened our uh, services for non-elective procedures. Uh, and we had few things in mind. We have to, to gain back uh, or to, to gain the patient's uh, trust while we maintain their safe, safety. We have to uh, have a supply chain for PPEs, for personal protective equipment, to make sure that we have enough uh, uh, for our faculty and staff and residents. We have to deal with the attrition of our clinical staff and, and this is because of the stress of this situation is, uh, is, is inducing. And, and more than that, wearing uh, uh, three levels of protection, to N95, surgical mask, and uh, uh, face shield is not an easy uh, situation. And uh, it's really tiring doing that. So we have to think about shifts, and doing extending hours, because it takes longer to treat every patient with all the measures that we take. And uh, we have to think, we had to think how we are reopening our offsite clinics, providing the same level of protection uh, to our patients and our uh, providers. So what is happening now? The new class that arrived, uh, arrived as planned on June 15, orientation we did mainly online. All lectures and seminars are given by e-learning. We're extending our clinical hours. We're trying to still maintain resident staff teams and sheets. We have designated rest areas to allow social distancing. We have next year's interviews that start now. Everything will be done by Zoom, and each department will uh, try to uh, have uh, uh, virtual tours through the facilities uh, that the, uh, applica the applicants can, can follow. Only hands-on and clinical teaching are allowed in person. We have daily screening in the two ways that in, in when people get into the building, and also uh, the chat, doctor chat box that the faculty and students are using. Testing for patient uh, for COVID-19 is based on the procedure that is uh, uh, pro that, that, that we provide and the patient medical status. We had to come with some clinical uh, for some creative ideas to to have uh, to, to be able to uh, to provide the care that uh, in the level that we want. One of the ideas was having one of our smile movies in the N95 
the front of our building uh, for patient triaging for urgent care. If you uh, remember, I told you that we had about 100 to 120 patients a day uh, and we, uh, during the COVID outbreak, and we were assumed that after we uh, reopen, this number will go down. Apparently it does not. We still have very high numbers of emergency patients coming uh, to, to seek for help in our, uh, in our clinics. So we're triaging the patient outside in the smile mobile and we have tents that the patient can wait in uh, until uh, they are screened uh, or triaged in the smile mobile. The issue of course will be in the winter and we're looking at uh, several options. One of them is having uh, military tents that uh, are, can provide better eating uh, during the winter. Uh, another thing that we're doing is uh, trying to expand our teledentistry pro program, uh, programs to screen patients and provide uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, screening patients before they come into our building and answer the question, should they come or shouldn't, or shouldn't they come for treatment in our building. Uh, this is the daily patient volume. And th th this is the volume that we had before uh, the uh, uh, outbreak. This is the volume of the patient we had after. And you can see there is an increase. We are now about in about 50% uh, or 60% capacity of where we were before, but we hope that with, with improving our efficiency and the, and the care that we provide, we'll be able to uh, increase the numbers further. Uh, with that situation of uh, having a, a, a pandemic that, that we were not ready for, uh, I have to say that for decades, dentists have successfully treated patients with infectious diseases such as HIV, hepatitis C, influenza, tuberculosis, and others. Uh, when I started practicing, it was before the HIV pandemic, and many dentists work without gloves or, or even uh, sometimes masks. And the HIV pandemic made us better and changed the, uh, the way we provide care in dentistry. So I believe that the COVID-19 pandemic is also an opportunity to improve the infection control and uh, what we do and the way we provide care. And uh, uh, the way to look at it is uh, we need to think uh, about several levels. Improving our PPEs, the, the, the uh, personal protective equipment that we use, I think that you already did. N95 is becoming the standard, although I'm not sure that it has to be the standard because the surgical mask level three provide similar protection, but uh, this is becoming the standard. The gowns, gloves, face shields, eye protection, all this is already happening. Uh, administrative control like work policies, staff rotation, physical distancing, I think that we are already doing. Engineering control uh, that every dentist should think about, this is something that we need to further work on. Uh, how do we control uh, splatter uh, droplets? How do we control aerosol? And there are many things that can be already done. Air purifiers that we're having in our, we'll have in all our clinics uh, uh, next week. Uh, uh, working on the air change rate in the building, and that may be a little bit more costly uh, thing to do, but we can do that. Um, are, are things that are having a second suction that uh, many dentists uh, are now uh, using. Um, those things are things that can improve the, uh, the aerosol and the air control in the buildings. There are other things that can be done is uh, 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 vaccines that, I, that, uh, that is in progress, but it may take a year or so before it will be, happy. It, it will be available for everyone. Herd immunity or maybe relying on a miracle that will take away the virus. But we need to wait for herd immunity vaccines or a miracle that until then, we can work on the improvement in PPA, PPEs, administrative control, and the engineering control. But we didn't do only, uh, in the last year only, we didn't deal only with the COVID-19. There are many other things that we did and, and, and I would like to share with you. Uh, our oral and maxillofacial surgery department added an MD program, uh, MD track to their specialty in oral and maxillofacial surgery, and MBA track. I'm the first student in the MBA track already enrolled this year. We have a new specialty in dental public health. Dr. Sandeepa Kanjendra is uh, leading this program. We uh, develop an e-learning committee uh, with faculty, staff that are working together uh, to improve the way we provide e-learning. E-learning is not just providing the lecture online like I do now on Zoom. Uh, there are uh, tools and methods that we can use and we're working together with the Warner School of Education to develop uh, a 
uh, better programs of better e-learning teaching. All the, uh, all the members of the committee were already trained by the uh, uh, Warner School of Medicine in e-learning. We uh, established an teledentistry division led by Dr. Sean McLaren. Actually, he, Dr. McLaren, Dr. Papichka are uh, national leaders in teledentistry. We also uh, have a new international academic memorandum of understanding with uh, Qingdao in China, Krakow in Poland, in Poland, and Manifold in India. And this is in addition to existing, existing international uh, academic memorandums that we have. Uh, wonderful news is that we moved uh, to uh, two ranks uh, up and we are now number seven in the country in uh, funding for uh, by the National Institute of Dental Craniofacial Research. Um, this is uh, wonderful if you think about uh, uh, our size. Uh, um, we are way ahead uh, universities that uh, have, uh, we have uh, 60, close to 70 full-time faculty members uh, and, and compared to I would, uh, compare it, for example, to NYU that we have hundreds of faculty members and we are number seven in the country. Uh, we were nine uh, a year ago and I think we were 10 two years ago. So we are moving up uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm very proud of, of that, this achievement. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Emil Rousseau was elected uh, to the American Board of Orthodontics, uh, uh, comprised of, of only eight members in the entire uh, from all over the country. Dr. Carl Erkeley was named the Educator of the Year by the American College of Prostodontics. Uh, Dr. Antonio Kolokitas, uh, uh, the Chair of Oral Medicine Excellent Fashion Surgery, completed the Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine, ELAM program. And she, during that program, she developed uh, that program uh, to allow OMF resident to earn Executive Master, the, the MBA degree that you already saw earlier that uh, was approved uh, in and, and we have the first student enrolled in this program. Uh, Dr. Elad uh, uh, was uh, the multi-dimensional association of supportive care in cancer awarded Dr. El Sharon Elad, the 2019 Outstanding Study Group leader, and her group was also named the Outst Outstanding Study Group. Our, uh, this year's students uh, group is uh, uh, very diverse as usual. Uh, we have students from uh, 39 count countries and 14 states. 50% um, are female and 50% are male. Uh, this is uh, uh, an improvement compared to previous years. 44% um, six, uh, are US citizen permanent residents. Uh, our average, their average is 33. 20% are pursuing additional degree, but 19% already have additional degree, PhD, MBA, MPH, and our faculty members are also very diverse, and you can see, I think, partial list of the countries where uh, we come from. Uh, another thing that we did, I'm sure that you know that uh, George Eastman did not, uh, uh, also established uh, dental dispensaries in other countries than, uh, than the United States. Uh, he established a dental dispensary in London, in Rome, in uh, Brussels, Stockholm, and Paris. Uh, and, and then the one, of course, in, uh, in, uh, in Rochester. The one in uh, Brussels is closed, but we have wonderful relations with the other existing, existing um, uh, uh, dental, dental institutes. And we established together with uh, uh, London, um, Stockholm, and Rome, the Eastern International Alliance Global Rounds. And every three months, uh, our uh, faculty and residents are presenting, presenting cases uh, from uh, each institute and we share knowledge and questions. Uh, the, first three, uh, the, first three, um, the first three sessions already were, uh, took place in oral medicine and, and the topics of oral medicine, pediatric dentistry and periodontology. In the first three, Rome did not join yet, but in the next one uh, that will be on uh, prostodontics and implants, uh, Rome will also join, and that will be in September 18th. In November 30th, 13th, we will have a, a, a session on pain. The time is a little bit challenging because it's at 8 o'clock in the morning in New York, 1 o'clock in London, and 2 o'clock in Stockholm. Um, and we found time that we can all, we can all present at the same time. Uh, here you can see how the screen looks. This is Dr. Myrowitz uh, moderating the, uh, the session. 
We are, as I mentioned earlier, expanding our teledentistry program. Here you see Dr. McLaren uh, talking to a kid in one of the, uh, the sites that we have a teledentistry, site, teledentistry program. And we're expanding our sites uh, uh, to other areas and other, uh, and other disciplines as well. I'm very proud of our next generation of leaders, and I'm sure that this is, uh, uh, I'm not sure that it, have, it includes all the new leaders, but we appointed new leaders in different uh, various positions of program directors and other leadership position to uh, have the next generation ready and, uh, and take over our place when, when, when needed. Uh, and uh, all of them are uh, dedicated faculty members uh, with a wonderful uh, clinical and academic uh, research, academics, and teaching uh, skills. Another thing that I would like to share with you is uh, the renovation and the new clinics that we opened recently. Uh, the, the building that, the, the main building here, uh, uh, the Eastman Dental Center, was designed for 40 to 50,000 patients' uh, visits a year. Unfortunately, uh, uh, we are having now close to 100,000 visits a year. The problem is uh, that our clinics were not really renovated uh, in the last, uh, um, since, since it was uh, established, uh, with the exception of the Howitt Urgent Dental Care Clinic that was opened uh, about 10 years ago, the prostodontic clinics that was renovated uh, with the help of the alumni, and I'm sure, I'm sorry that I, that I don't think that you can see their name, but the prostodontics alumni uh, helped uh, uh, in renovating this clinic, and the orthodontics clinic that was renovated with the help of the uh, orthodontics alumni. So uh, we decided that it's about time and uh, last year and last a year ago in, in July we completed the renovation that included new residents and uh, uh, students area uh, as that you can see here in the concourse. We have renovated the pediatric uh, dentistry clinic with the help uh, of Dr. Dennis Clements and Dr. Martha M. Keens Keels, uh, uh, to have a completely new and renovated pediatric dentistry clinic. We have new uh, uh, boardroom and seminar rooms. We renovated the, uh, we, uh, we renovated the period periodontology clinic. We replaced all the chairs in general dentistry clinic. And we, did, we uh, uh, opened new oral and maxillofacial surgery clinics and, and uh, IV sedation room that you can see here in the picture. An interesting and a new approach uh, that we developed was having a special care interdisciplinary clinic. Here you see the entrance of this clinic in our second floor of the building. This is an elevator that is big enough to have patients on stretchers, wheelchairs. This is the waiting room. And this is an example. This is the, uh, the uh, outline of the clinic. You can see bigger rooms that have uh, two doors and allow patients uh, uh, to, to be treated more comfortably. This is an example of a chair in this clinic that is a gliding chair that we can be moved and replaced by a wheelchair, as you can see here, or by a bariatric chair. We have chairs that can treat patients up to uh, 125 pounds, I think, that a normal chair cannot carry. And we have a lot, big group of patients that are coming and seeking for treatment uh, in our clinic. The idea of having a clinic for a patient with a, complex conditions that include patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities, people with medically complex condition, and older adults and senior citizens came from the problem that, when, when a problem that we experience uh, uh, nation, nationwide, uh, there is increase in life expectancy of patients with complex medical condition. For example, patients with the average age for patients with intellectual and developmental disability, lifespan is about 65 years old. Usually they've been treated by, by pediatric dentists, but when they are adults, they should be treated uh, differently. Uh, there is a, a lack of uh, properly trained providers and, and we are helping and training people to treat patients with special needs or medically complex conditions. Uh, com and, and there is also shortage in the equipped facilities, like I showed you earlier, I mean, facilities that treat patients on wheelchairs, and patients that need bariatric chairs and so on. Uh, so we decided that we need to approach this issue and uh, we developed a system that include our specialty care clinic that uh, we have here in Eastman Dental Center, second floor, the oral surgery clinic that uh, 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 the treating, providing surgical treatment to patients with, medic with complex medical conditions and the complex care center that uh, is uh, a new clinic, relatively new clinic developed by the, uh, by the 
University of Rochester Medical Center that patient with complex conditions are treated by physicians and dentists. And here you can see Dr. Tiffany Pacino, the director of the, uh, of the center, she is a medical doctor, and Dr. Adela Panarova treating together a patient with, uh, medic with complex medical condition. So we try to navigate between the three facilities that we have, the surgical facility patient that can treat patient with that need surgeries and are under a, a significant medical condition. Our specialty care that where we have our old specialties and disciplines of dentistry that treat patients with complex conditions and the complex care center where physicians and dentists can work together and help those patients. We also opened a new perinatal oral health clinic led by uh, Dr. Jin Chow, and also we have another arm for this clinic by Linda Subala and Dr. Ren. Uh, the patient uh, uh, during their uh, pregnancy uh, developed unique problems, and some of the providers uh, do not see those patients because of they, 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 because of risk that uh, well, well they're well, because they're concerned that they, they can they can be a risk for the patient. For the, uh, or for the baby. So we are seeing those patients during their pregnancy, uh, addressing their special needs, and we're also uh, seeing the uh, babies or the children when, in the first year of their life to be able to provide them uh, uh, care and to avoid the early childhood caries. Uh, this is a new clinic that just started and, and it's uh, fully booked for the next few months. I'll give an example of several cases or maybe a couple of cases of patients that are treated in, in our facility. This is Michael. Michael uh, has suffered from cerebral palsy and uh, this is his occlusion. This is the way he, he closed his uh, mouth. Uh, he was uh, rejected from several uh, facilities uh, for uh, dramatic surgery because of low muscle tone and concerns about providing the anesthesia. But, but we did the treatment here and uh, he was treated by uh, Dr. Dimitrios Mikhailanakis, an orthodontist, Dr. Eliana Kotsalidi, uh, a, a, a periodontist, and George, Dr. John Barassi, an oral surgeon. So the treatment uh, included first uh, by Dr. Mikhailanakis, uh, aligning the teeth in, in a way that when Dr. Barassi, is first, sorry, first it started by looking at his uh, periodontal health by Dr. Kotsalidi, uh, he has some uh, uh, issues related to medication that he's taking as well that was treated by her. And then by Dr. Michele Enakis that aligned the teeth in a way that when Dr. Barassi did the surgery that, uh, and, and moved the jaws, the teeth were already re ready, already in a, a occlusion, in, in perfect occlusion uh, uh, after the surgery. And this is the outcome. This is how Michael looks uh, after the surgeries. This was how he started and this is how you look now. This is a long process to have the treatment. We also, I think, need to complement the anesthesiology uh, department here in Rochester that uh, did the general anesthesia for the surgeon. This is a phenomenal outcome and, and really life changer for, for Michael. Uh, this is a patient with ectodermal dysplasia that was seen by Dr. Constantinos uh, Kokitakis and uh, Dr. Alexandra Tsigarida, uh, a periodontist and prostodontist. And uh, this is how we looked with the uh, temporary uh, restoration. This is not the final restoration. And see how uh, different it looks. And uh, I'm sure uh, that the patient is very happy with the outcome. So I will stop here. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you again for, for listening for what I had to say. Uh, this is also a picture from uh, an event here for uh, Black Lives Matters and White Coats for Black Lives that was done here in, uh, in the campus and our faculty and resident, uh, resident uh, participated in. Um, I'll be happy to take questions and to answer questions if, uh, if there are any. Yes, we, <clears throat> we have a couple of questions, uh, Dr. Eliev. Uh, one from our friend Kelly. How do you think lessons learned during the COVID pandemic will change dental practice in the future? Will there be a greater reliance uh, or uh, on or use of teledentistry? And are yeah. there, could this be a new area of research? Oh yeah, there'll, there'll be a dentistry will not look the same, I, I, I'm sure. Um, the, the extended PPE that we wear will make things a little bit more complicated. 
therefore, uh, I think that relying on, on teledentistry is more and more important. That's why we established our division of teledentistry. Um, I think that uh, we are, I thought we were already doing for pediatric screening for pediatric dentistry patients, and we did it for, for, for many years, and uh, we have shown in a study by Dr. McLaren and Dr. Papichka that the compliance improved from 20% to more than 90% uh, after having a teledentistry session. But I think that we can do beyond that. We can advise patients about their condition with teledentistry. Uh, we can look at oral lesions. Uh, we can talk, we can uh, consult patients with oral facial pain. We can have uh, a treatment plan approved or discussed with the patient with teledentistry. We can limit the number of visits of the patient with, with coming to to, to see the dentist that will reduce their cost. It will be more, more, more con convenient for the patient. So we're going to that direction more and more. We cannot provide care yet. I mean, full care, uh, we cannot uh, provide uh, dental care or uh, periodontal care in, in, with the teledentistry, but we can do all the screening and things beyond that. All the, all the envelope treatment we can do with, with teledentistry. We have another question from, excuse me, another question from our good friend Bill here in Rochester. It is apparent that EIOH is a shining example of how to have properly navigated the COVID outbreak. Did you receive inquiries from other American institutions and has there been an opportunity to collaborate on best practices? I would agree, of course, but uh... We, we had we were approached by several in several ways. What, the first thing was uh, the paper I showed uh, earlier, the three papers that we published related to, to COVID-19. And um, we were approached uh, first uh, um, um, to discuss uh, the first paper that we published and just describe how dentistry should be. Then we were approached again uh, after the, uh, by, by many after the webinar that, uh, that we had. And lastly, I think that Dr. Ren is uh, presenting at the American Dental Association webinar his experience uh, in, in urgent, because he's the, he's the director of our urgent care clinic and, and the leader in the, some of the papers that, uh, that we published. So I think that people uh, um, are interested in what we did. The main differences, I think, are related to the fact that we didn't stop the services, our residents continued working. Uh, and that was part of their education, how to deal with a, a situation like this. The teledentistry, uh, I think that was a, a, a unique uh, thing that we did. And I hear from other deans that uh, there are many schools are doing, that, are doing it now. Uh, but I think that we will all should learn from each other. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, we need to have an open discussion with other schools, with other providers with the dental association, how we can provide better dentistry. We cannot stop providing dentistry. We just need to do it in a safer way and, and gain back the patient's trust. Very good. We have a very popular question from our friend uh, Vince in Maryland. Any thoughts on negative pressure treatment rooms to keep the virus under control? Yeah, the, we have in Eastman, we have here two negative pressure rooms. Uh, but even with negative pressure room, it depends on the, on the airflow direction, uh, if it works or not. So uh, our goal is to get uh, all our rooms into air exchange uh, that will be uh, uh, around uh, 16 or 17 or 18 times an hour. Uh, in that case, I think that we're in a safe uh, environment. We're doing here a study uh, we are measuring the effect of uh, air purifiers uh, and, and not an additional suction on, on the level of aerosol on the air exchange. So negative pressure rooms uh, are not the only solution and they are not always the solution. They are of course uh, something that can be used but it's an expensive and I'm not sure that it's necessary if the air exchange is good enough using a second suction. There is a study one of the studies, no, not one of those that I showed, but the study showing that having additional suction, uh, and those that are on the market now, 98% of the aerosol is taken care of. So there is no problem with, uh, uh, it reduces the, the aerosol threat significantly. So sig uh, a decent air exchange, uh, uh, air purifiers, 
and the second uh, uh, suction probably giving a good answer to the problem. In the third paper that I showed you that we are, we, we were, was accepted for publication, we showed that the risk is very, very minimal for dentists to, to, to get the, uh, the condition or to, get, to be effect, infected by the virus if they wear masks, eye protection, and uh, use uh, uh, all the, the, the advanced PPEs that are used. I'll be happy to, to, to share the, uh, the link for the paper for those who are interested. Uh, I just want to make a remark that our really good friend Dennis in North Carolina has offered up some really good points. One of them being uh, the use of UV light in the air handler. Uh, so when is it ex when it is exchanged, it has been uh, sterilized. Needs about six minute air exchange rate. Uh, but we also have another question. That, that's something that we're looking at, and there is also UV light that can be uh, during that we can use during the uh, treatment. Uh, it's it's a sealing uh, UV light. We need to look at it, we need to look at the data. The problem is that we need, there's, there are many good ideas, we need, we're looking at data and based on data, we're trying to make decisions. But yeah, the UV light is one of the, uh, the ideas that people are using. Yeah. Matt in Texas asked, how does EIOH compare to peer institutions with regard to remote training and education? Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know how other schools are doing it, but we are. We were talking about moving to e-learning for a while, and we, we established a committee, and we thought how we could do it. And then, within a day or within a week, we moved all our lectures into uh, online lectures. The issue is that uh, online lectures is not e-learning. E-learning, we need to build an e-learning uh, environment. And that's what we're trying to move forward with. So all our lectures are online and all our lectures are recorded that our residents can take them whenever they want. Uh, but we're trying to build a better environment. And I think that I will not take the credit to, to EIOH because we're relying on the, on the program in, in our uh, Warner School of Education. And they really, they, they really helped us to build a better program, a, a, a better e-learning program. I don't think that we got to the level that we want yet, but by the end of this academic year, I think that we will be. And uh, we are now having people from the e-learning committee that is working with each uh, course director and helping them to build the environment better. So I don't know how well others are doing, but I think that we will do very well by the end of the academic year. We have one last question before we wrap up. I have some final remarks, but the question is a good one to end on. Uh, it's from New York Metro area. It's to the point. Dr. Eliev, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> uh, I think that uh, the new, the, there is a new normal. I mean, I mean, it, it, the world is different. And uh, I would like everybody to be safe. I would like the people, the, the, the patients, the providers feel that they are safe and, and, and while we can continue providing care. But I'm really concerned about the financial uh, uh, aspects because uh, the, the, the financial, the financials will be different as well because treatment takes longer if we want to maintain, or to, keep, to, to maintain safety and to maintain the high quality of care that we provide. Uh, so we'll need to find resources uh, or if more efficient ways to be able to provide care and still be uh, reimbursed efficiently. I'm also concerned that a lot of dentists will decide that it's too difficult, it's too complicated for them uh, to maintain uh, all the things that we discussed earlier and there will be a shortage in dentists. So right now we have a, re a relatively shortage in dentists in rural areas uh, and I'm afraid that this will even, even increase. So we need to find ways to be efficient provide wonderful care and do it in this new environment that uh, developed, uh, that, that happened. I mean, without, without uh, of course, uh, um, any, any good preparation to it. Although, if you think about it, we should have been prepared. I mean, uh, that's not the first virus. And then, you know what? I'm sure that it's not the last one too. Any, any other questions, Brian? Yes, one last one just came in uh, from a good friend of ours in the upper Midwest. Given the challenges with obtaining FDA registered PPE, have you established an EIOH 
PPE procurement team, or do you rely on the medical center? It's both. We have a, we have a wonderful help and support from the medical center. Uh, here in the medical center, uh, we are uh, disinfecting N95 up to 20 uh, cycles. Uh, so we are relying on them. So every resident, every provider has at least two uh, uh, N95. And uh, they are, uh, we are helping, we're, we're, we're sending them for disinfection. Uh, we have uh, our own team that is working to get uh, PPEs as, as much as needed, but we also get wonderful support from the medical center. And with, the goal is to have three months supply. We're not there yet, uh, but uh, hopefully with time we'll, we'll build that, uh, that, uh, that, that we'll, we'll have enough to, to supply, enough to have like 90 days supplies. Very good. Uh, well, with that, I'd like to say that on behalf of Dr. Eliev and myself, uh, I'd really like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. We had some really good numbers. Uh, again, please feel welcome to email me directly with any additional questions and there is be on the lookout for future EIOH virtual engagement series events and ways to stay connected through the Meliora Collective, uh, our exclusive online university network to make meaningful professional and personal connections. Thank you. Um, there is, uh, I, I, that will be online. I can still answer questions. I mean, uh, Matt, will I be able to continue answering questions? Hang on, let's see if we can pull it up here. There's one question. I think professionals may now have a problem with supporting staff, at least for now, especially of hygienists. And a lot of thank yous have come in. Um, given all of the good work done at EIOH, would it be possible to collaborate with other institutions, uh, possibly Meharry and Howard to train a more diverse population of dentists? That's exactly the one that I'm answering. Uh, yes, we would love to. Uh, it will be uh, something that we really want to do. Very good. Very good. Well, we'll reach out to that alone. Again, thank you everybody very much for joining today. Uh, Dr. Elliot, do you have any final comments? Thank you all. I think that it's a new, a new life, a new world, but uh, after a crisis only good things are happening and, and that's what will happen that's what will happen here i'm sure thank you all yep